Hello from wherever you are. My name is John McFarland, Adult Librarian for Nashville Public Libraries, and welcome back to our second and final episode on how to play checkers. Last week, we covered the basics, some common errors to avoid, and some strategy. This week, we're going to cover a little more detailed strategy on how to play better, as well as some fun variants, because this is not the only way to play the game. Let's get stuck in. Last week, we talked about how to play the game. This week, we're going to talk about more advanced strategies. Now, you're wondering, where can you find more information about strategies? Glad you asked. You can look in the library catalog for the word Hoyle. It's named after a 17th century game treatise writer named Edmund Hoyle. If you go into our catalog, search for the word Hoyle, it'll come up with numerous options for the basics that we talked about last week, more advanced ways to play the game, and some of the variants we're going to talk about today. We got started with openings, this middle part of the board that pieces had to move. Let's look into just a couple ways that you could have played the game a little differently and how the game looks. So uh, we talked about the notation before that one, two, three, four. We'll go over it the whole time again today, but on here it shows us the notation as 11 to 15. So that is one way that you can follow along with almost all of these books. They will take you step by step. So uh, let's take a look here. Oh, and that's another way to open. And this person counters by this way. So that way we're starting to try and move forward by blocking options. So notice this person's at risk. I can move that a little forward. So now we've got, what do we want to do here? We're going to do this over here. And then this person's going to move over here. So it does involve the sacrifice of a piece here. But it does allow for you to start making moves. And notice that hardly anything has moved over here. So you've still got on the white side a good defense. This is the name of the game. Having a good defense that you can use in order to keep moving forward slowly, but surely. But it also means that you can now move this piece over here to prevent it from being jumped. So if this moves forward, now you've got not one, but two options. And you got a free space that you can move forward if somebody starts leaving this corner. So as I'm just looking at this basic opening, I'm going to start moving these pieces and try and get over here to this corner. Because the faster you can get pieces kinged, the better off you're going to be and the easier it becomes. So let's do another one as an example here. Uh, so let's see, this one has here, and then here, followed by here, followed by here, and then moving forward over here. So this leaves a little bit of open space, but it's the same kind of principle where this piece is moved forward. Oops, sorry, I need to capture this piece first. Some days I forget about the capturing rule. So we've got this piece captured here, and that's sometimes when this game can really flow, where now you've got these pieces moved and we've traded off two for each of us. I've got one here in the corner. So now this piece just can't move unless it moves this way. This piece can pretty much move, but it opens up this space. So if I was playing this as white, I'd just ignore this piece for as many turns as needed, because if we have all of my pieces over here as black, this piece can just waltz right in. Because again, the faster you can get king, the easier your options are. So let's do one more for funsies. 
You'll notice that this piece being moved here to the center is pretty popular. A lot of people like going for these four pieces right here because this provides you with just in sheer number of moves, the most options. So let's say we'll have, I'm trying to move some of these pieces up to make it a little easier on us. Now, I'll do this, I'll do this. Uh, and that would be a terrible move because now I'm trying to get control of this center part, but I've opened up to a double jump. So from here, it really is trial and error as a starting point and as a way that you can keep making move after move. And this involves playing game after game and don't get frustrated. It is just purely about learning and repetition and the more efficiently you can move those pieces forward, the better off you're gonna be. So uh, let's take a little step back, a little more history. I talked about some last week, but we've got more history in the relatively recent times. And then I will get into a full playthrough of a game so you can see a little more advanced strategy of way to play. I wanna talk about how important this is to mind games and logic planning. So this was actually used as a teaching lesson by a lot of military figures as a way to run through the logic of the game and run through how to use the pieces and use the pieces in the right way. So its use as stratagem is pretty well documented with English military and even the American military. Most notable recipient of Checkers logic, Ulysses S. Grant described Checkers as his favorite game and taught it to his other generals. So now we've learned the basic concepts. We've taken some opening strategies. Now is to put everything into practice. And I'm gonna go up against the hardest thing I know, a computer. This is how I started learning how to play some of these games and one of the most valuable resources I can find. So now we'll switch this up rather than looking at the board. We'll show you how to play it on game and we'll see if I can beat a computer. So we're gonna look right here. Um, so remember how we've talked about looking at the center of the board, these little four black squares right here. So we're gonna go and take this piece and move it here and see what we come up with. So that looks about right. So I know that, let's see, this piece and this piece. So I'm gonna go over to the corner here and I may have to jump them in a second, but I wanna see what move they take. Notice how the computer is very helpful in telling me that I must take that piece, but I think that's a good move. Um, I'm going to go ahead and sacrifice this piece so it has to jump, and I'll take that piece. So now we're sitting at two pieces a piece. Um, I don't like the ones that are here in the corner. I am not going to lie to you, but uh, we will do this, and we're going to be forced to jump there, getting some more sacrificial moves. We'll go into the corner here and force another jump, which will be a one jump and two jumps. Now we're starting to do a little better. We're gonna block their outside piece in. Now we are in a position where we're home row. We're gonna do, let's see, I'm kind of divided whether I wanna do over here, because eventually I'll have to move up we're gonna actually go over to the side here. Let's see now. Um, hmm. Decisions, decisions. So their first home row piece got moved and I can't capture this one, but 
we're at least starting to get some movement. Uh, but notice how I can't use this piece at all because they're blocking in these two right here. So I'm gonna ignore this piece for now. Uh, we're gonna ignore this piece for now. Let's see, I think we're gonna have, I'm afraid, no choice but to move up. We will move to the right here, kind of deal with that motion. Sacrifice a piece and gain another one. So we're still doing the one up and they eventually have to move, which means we are about to experience the joys of pieces being kings. Well, we're probably gonna win this one simply because they're running out of room. Uh, so we're gonna go ahead and king this other piece because it's always more beneficial to have pieces that can be kinged. We're gonna block this corner here, which means now the computer's going to be running scared as it should be because we have pretty much won this game here. I'll move piece from the corner. Um, hmm. We're gonna move this up here. Ah, see, if I was the red piece, I would have moved right here and gotten a, at least one move away, but this will be the last piece. So now we have captured all 12 pieces, which means that because of that, we win the game. So that was just a simple run through of how to play checkers against the computer. See, if I can do it, promise you can too. After the Victorian era really got started going and we started seeing more newspapers and journals proliferate across the planet. We saw that the American Checkers Federation and the English Draughts Association started holding gentlemanly tournaments with large prize pools of $100, which back then was worth quite a bit more. And what you saw is they would print, I talked about the notation, they would print the notation of the game so you could follow along and see how the game went for these championships. And this got even more people playing within gentlemanly Victorian society. Okay, back to the game. Now, I promised you fun variants to try and I intend to deliver. So now that we've gone over the basic concepts and how to play, let's, turn things on their head a little bit. So I've got two that I wanna show you real quick. They're real easy. We just flip the rules. So instead of you wanting to capture your opponent's pieces, you wanna lose pieces. So remember that you have to capture a piece if you are available. So instead of, I wanna try and avoid this, you wanna lean right into it. And the first person to lose all of their pieces is the winner. There's no ties on that one. So I kind of like the idea of that, of turning ideas on their head and experimenting with stuff. Speaking of turning, one more variant to try is right here. Instead of going all the way through, let's actually get to take some pieces off the board here. So what we're trying to do is go from one side of the board to the other, and you can still block pieces, you can still move, but you can, let's see, do this here. You still have the so, same jump rules that always apply, and then you can move diagonal like that. So it takes a little bit of experimenting to make it work and you'll probably get blocked a couple times, but I think it's a fun little brain teaser and challenger when you're so used to looking at it from a front back perspective. So give those a whirl, try those at home. You can also just come up with your own variants. Experiment, it's always fun to have. One last piece of history before we end this, the modern age. 
Now you may have seen this in film and TV and read about it in books about people who will play chess and checkers at Central Park in New York or Washington Square. You'd be surprised to find that checkers is just as prevalent as chess. So you have table upon table upon table of people waiting to play all of these games. Now, you also will find all across the world because of the ease of producing some of these boards and you don't even need produced pieces. People make their own as long as it has alternating colors. It works. It's why this game is so easy to reproduce. It's why this game is so well known and commonly understood all across the world. That's all the time we have for today. Thanks for tuning in. I hope you feel a little more comfortable in how to play checkers, and now you can practice by yourself or with a friend, but that's the next step. Let us know exactly what you would like to see from future games, and you may see it before you know it. Also, our NPL Universe page has great other programming you can check out. See you next time.